to talk today about the value of viability testing in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy before deciding about revascularization. Okay. The classic, the classic example is a patient with heart failure, low EF, uh, maybe some segmental akinesis, and multivessel disease on coronary angiography. Should viability testing be performed before revascularization with cabbage or PCI? I am going to dissect that question via multiple case scenarios. And uh, I will start by explaining some of the theory behind it. There are two definitions for, for viability. One is uh, regional viability. And this is defined as a regional dysfunction improvement after revascularization by at least one point from akinesis to hypokinesis or from hypokinesis to normal. More importantly, the second definition of viability is a global viability, and that's probably more important in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy referred for revascularization in the setting of heart failure. And it is defined as an EF improvement of more than 5% with revascularization. Note that viability is truly defined in retrospect. After you've already revascularized, you look back and see whether there has been improvement. Viability tests try to predict that preemptively. And there are four viability tests that try to predict that. There is thallium myocardial uptake, and uptake over 50% predicts viability. Low-dose dobutamine echocardiography, PET scan, and cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI is considered the highest yield test overall. Um, and it can detect scar thickness uh, of the dysfunctional myocardium. The scar thickness less than 25% is very highly predictive of viability, whereas the scar thickness over 50% is highly predictive of non-viability. This is a test with a sensitivity and specificity of over 80%. Those four testing modalities can define segmental regional viability of each uh, coronary territory, but they can also define global viability, which is more difficult to define. Global viability has been defined variably depending on the trials. One definition commonly used is that you have four of the dysfunction, dysfunctional segments that are viable. For example, imagine a patient with anterior uh, akinesis. In order to say that he is a globally viable, you need to have four anterior segments that are viable, at least four segments that are dysfunctional that are also viable. Those four will correspond to 25% of the LV, assuming a 17-segment model. Alternatively, global viability can be defined as a viability of over 65 to 70% of the whole myocardium, including functional and dysfunctional segments. And this, ha this is what has been used in the STITCH trial. I will use a case to explain the concept. A 69-year-old man with no known cardiac history presents with decompensated HF. He does not have exertional chest pain. EKG shows anterior Q waves, and echo shows enteroapical dyskinesis with EF of 25%. Coronary angiography shows a totally occluded LAD and severe RCA disease. Beside medical therapy, what is the best revascularization option? A, revascularization does not improve outcomes at this point, so no revascularization is needed. B, revascularize with cabbage without further testing. C, perform viability testing with MRI. Perform cabbage if the anterior wall is viable. D, perform viability testing with MRI. Perform cabbage if four segments of the anterior or apical wall are deemed viable. Basically, D is providing a more specific answer than C. The answer to that question is B, perform cabbage without any viability testing. This is based on two major trials. One, most importantly, is a STITCH trial uh, viability substudy, 
which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the other one is part two trial published in JAK. In both those trials, lack of viability does, did not attenuate post-cabbage benefit. Importantly, this particular patient here has Q waves, but Q waves were not, did not exclude the potential benefit from cabbage and were not an exclusion criterion from the latter trials. I will describe the main STITCH trial. STITCH trial randomized patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy and EF less than 35% to cabbage versus medical therapy. Most of these patients had a three vessel disease, often with a proximal LAD disease and a prior history of MI. Importantly, this trial excluded patients with severe angina and advanced class 4 HF, and mainly consisted of patients with low EF, no or mild angina, and mild heart failure. Patients were not excluded based on viability testing. And uh, half of the patients underwent viability testing uh, and uh, were substratified depending on the presence or absence of viability. At five years, cabbage was associated with a strong trend towards mortality reduction uh, by 1.5% per year, which became significant at 10 years. It also was associated with a significant reduction of each of the following endpoints, cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization for heart failure or cardiovascular causes. Note that the benefit of cabbage was not dramatic. You know, the reduction of mortality was from 8% to 6.5% per year. Uh, but you can expect that this benefit to be more pronounced in patients with a higher absolute mortality. In the STITCH trial, 50% of the patient underwent viability testing with either stress echo or SPECT and were randomized to cabbage versus medical therapy regardless of viability. In the published substudy, STITCH viability substudy, cabbage was beneficial regardless of viability and viability did not provide any discriminatory effect. Viability did predict eventual EF improvement, whether with cabbage or medical therapy. However, cabbage reduced mortality independently of EF improvement. Whether you did or did not improve your EF, you did benefit from cabbage. Whether you had or did not have viability, you did benefit from cabbage. Actually, cabbage was most beneficial in patients with the most extensive disease and the lowest EF regardless of viability. Actually, you can expect those patients to be less often viable, yet they derive more dramatic benefit from cabbage because they were sicker. As many therapies, you benefit more if you are sicker. There was no association between EF reversal and subsequent mortality or between viability and 10-year mortality. Therefore, the conclusion of this trial is in the chronic ischemic setting, revascularization for ischemic LV dysfunction is beneficial regardless of viability testing and regardless of whether EF eventually improves. This is why viability is given a class 2B recommendation in the ESC guidelines. Basically, it is a weak recommendation and viability testing should not be universally performed in ischemic cardiomyopathy before revascularization. So why did viability test fails? The idea of viability testing is attractive. If your myocardium is dead, then revascularization would not seem to improve your outcome and would expose you to an unnecessarily hazard. In fact, the uh, 30-day mortality in stitch trial after cabbage was close to 3%. Uh, so, you know, you need to have a justification to subject the patient to that early hazard. Viability seems like a good idea. However, it failed, and there are a variety of four reasons, in my opinion, that explain that failure. One, there is limited sensitivity and specificity of viability tests. Even the best of them, MRI, has limited uh, yield. More importantly, number two, viability is not a yes or no answer. We say that, you know, patients are either viable or not. That's how it's often, that's how the report is often formulated. 
Truth is, it's hard to exclude some viability within the territory of the diseased artery and within the non-viable territory. For example, the apex may not be viable, but the anterolateral wall is viable. Hence, revascularization of the LAD is still warranted. So the viability testing can be confusing. It can tell you the apex is non-viable, and for some, it may seem that, okay, the LAD territory is non-viable. But there are shades of gray, and there is extent, territorial extent of non-viability and viability that can dictate management. So it's more tricky than a yes or no answer. Even more importantly, the, the third reason is that even without any viability and any contractile and EF improvement, revascularization improves symptom status, heart failure, and mortality. And how does this happen if you don't have viability? This happens because revascularization may improve LV adverse remodeling. It reduces further LV dilatation, further deterioration of LV function, and may reduce the risk of further MI and further deterioration of LV. It may also preserve the infarct border zone integrity and reduce VT arising from that border zone. A fourth idea, also those, also it's an idea that uh, arises that arises from the stitch uh, viability study. The benefit from cabbage may be highest in the sickest patient, such as those with limited viability. In fact, a stitch analysis has shown that patients with the most severe ischemic cardiomyopathy derive the most benefit from cabbage, up to 50% mortality reduction rather than the around 25% uh, in the general population. So that's an important idea. This was defined as a combination of two of, of, two of the following three factors, three vessel disease, low EF less than 25%, and dilated, more significantly dilated uh, LV. And those are more likely to be associated with some degree of non-viability non in some territories. Another idea is that, in general, regardless of what you do with viability tests, 70 to 81 percent of patients with chronic ischemic LV dysfunction have significant improvement in LV function after revascularization. This number was 81 percent in stitch trial. So even if you close your eye and revascularize a patient without any testing, you know that 81 percent will improve, keeping in mind that the yield of the best of those four viability tests is actually around 80%. Well, closing your eyes and revascularizing has the same yield as performing viability tests. And that's another limitation of those tests. Therefore, this is a summary slide. Viability should not be used to decide whether to revascularize or not heart failure with reduced EF with a multivessel disease. Lack of viability does not negate the value of global revascularization, and those patients generally are best treated with revascularization. However, however, there is some value to viability testing. Viability testing may be used to guide the specific of segmental revascularization, not to exclude the overall revascularization, but to guide the specifics. For example, Lack of regional viability may help fine tune the details of the revascularization. For example, if you have somebody with three vessel disease and the RCA territory is non viable, you may choose to not revascularize the RCA, particularly if you're performing PCI and if PCI of an RCA is expected to be a complex PCI. So you can use the regional viability to fine tune the details of revascularization but not to exclude the overall revascularization. I want to quickly discuss uh, Q waves uh, since EKG is readily available and may have as much value as some of the viability tests. So the lack of extensive Q waves in more than two to three leads generally implies that the territory is viable and is a further argument against any viability testing. Conversely, the presence of Q-wave does not mean you're not viable. You're still most often viable, but less likely so, 60% probably of 
Q waves territory are viable. So if you have a Q wave in a patient with low EF and multivessel disease, a global left ventricular revascularization is still warranted, but viability testing may help guide the specifics of regional revascularization. For example, you may not revascularize a territory with Q waves. That's an idea similar to, the, to what I mentioned in the prior slide. I will use now another case. Uh, this is a 60-year-old man with heart failure and low EF who has 60% left main, 90% ostial LED, 100% mid LED after first diagonal, 90% OM1 and 80% mid RCA. He has anterior Q waves uh, and apical dyskinesis. Uh, by MRI, the apex is non-viable and the lateral wall is non-viable. He is not deemed a good candidate for cabbage, uh, regardless of viability, because of poor targets and a porcelain aorta. And because the surgeons often misread those viability tests. So he saw there is poor viability, he decided another reason, he provided another reason for non-suitability for cabbage. So should this patient receive PCI? The answer is no. A is no. B, perform PCI of everything. C, perform PCI of everything except the mid-LAD. D, perform PCI of uh, everything except mid-LAD and OM1. And E, perform only left main and RCA PCI. The correct answer here is D. Basically, perform PCI of the left main Ostial LED and mid RCA. Leave the mid LED and OM1, probably leave those alone. The idea here is that viability testing did not exclude the benefit of revascularization in this patient, but it did help simplify our PCI strategy and tailor it to the viable territory. Left main disease should always be revascularized as you cannot have a non-viable left main territory by definition, you would be dead. So viability testing is useless to decide whether you need to revascularize left main or not. It can help again, uh, tailor your strategy, provide you the exact detail of how you do the stenting. Here, for example, I would stent the left main into the LAD across the left circumflex because I value that proximal LED diagonal territory. It is viable, I want to protect it. I will also want to protect the CERC, although I wouldn't want to revascularize OM1 because this territory is non-viable. Okay, so I would stand left main into the LED and I would balloon the left circumflex to protect it if needed. But I would not revascularize the other ones, mid LED and OM1. That's another important question. Which of the following statements is incorrect regarding cabbage versus medical therapy in ischemic cardiomyopathy based on the STITCH trial? And basically, each one of the options try to answer it by true or false. A, viability predicted EF improvement with cabbage. Uh, this is true. B, viability predicted EF improvement with standalone medical therapy. This is a true as well. CEF improved to a similar magnitude with cabbage versus medical therapy if viability was present. That is a true, surprisingly, in the STITCH trial. D, viability did not predict the survival benefit from cabbage. Uh, that is true. Cabbage was beneficial regardless of the presence or absence of uh, viability as defined in that trial. E, ischemia testing predicted the survival benefit from cabbage. This one is false. Neither ischemia nor viability predicted the survival benefit from cabbage in the STITCH trial. F, sick patient with the worst LV dimension, worst EF, and most extensive CAD derived the most benefit from cabbage. That is true, as I mentioned. And those tend to have less viability, yet they derive more benefit. And G, viability was associated with a lower Mortality at five years, but not on adjusted analysis and not at 10 years. That is true. So again, the only false answer is uh, 
I will provide now two cases of regional disease and the value of regional revascularization and regional viability testing. This is unlike STITCH trial, which is a global revascularization of global dysfunction and multivessel disease. So this is a case. Like all the other cases in this presentation, those are real cases I've had uh, from my personal real patients. So 77-year-old woman presents with progressive dyspnea over the last week. Chest X-ray demonstrates pulmonary edema and EKG shows extensive anterior and inferior Q waves with no ST abnormality. Echo shows enteroapical akinesis with EF of 30% and no LV dilatation. Troponin is negative. Coronary angiogram is done and shows a 90% middle AD stenosis. What is the next step? PCI of the middle AD, viability testing of the anterior wall, if viable, only if viable, proceed with LED PCI. Stress testing of the anterior wall or standalone medical therapy with no viability testing and no PCI. The correct answer is A, perform PCI without any viability testing. To sum it up, this patient is presenting with a heart failure picture without acute MI, her troponin is negative, with evidence of extensive anterior and inferior Q waves. This presentation is consistent basically with either non-acute anterior infarct with a late heart failure presentation or no infarct at all it's a chronic anterior ischemia with a hibernating myocardium. A hibernating myocardium can give you Q wave. A stunned acute myocardium can also give you Q wave, even if the myocardium is not infarcted. So it's one of those two. Despite the Q wave, this case is not what we call the old trial case. Uh, there is no evidence of recent or acute clinical infarct, and the LED is not totally occluded. Uh, the old trial is uh, a trial that showed that patients who have an acute infarct who present subacutely one to 28 days later and who have an occluded artery do not benefit from PCI. But this is not the case here because we do not have anything suggestive of an acute clinical infarct in the last few days. For all we can tell, this may just be a hibernating myocardium, and it's best to assume so. So this should be treated as chronic CAD with cardiomyopathy. Q waves do not rule out viability in this context and may be seen with hibernation. In STITCH trial, neither viability nor ischemia testing predicted benefit from revascularization in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Indeed, in this patient, I performed LED PCI, and three months later, Q waves partially regressed, she continued to have Q waves, but only in leads V1, V3. They disappeared, they regressed, I would say, in leads V4, V6, and 2, 3 AVF. Furthermore, the anterior wall significantly improved to mild hypokinesis, and her EF improved from 30 to 45%. This is another case, and contrast this case with the prior one. A 68-year-old asymptomatic man undergoes preoperative EKG for hernia surgery. This is the EKG. This EKG shows extensive Q waves. You can see here QS waves in V2, um, V2, V3, V4, and V5, with actually a T elevation and T inversion, uh, suggestive of a dyskinetic anterior wall. Despite that, he's very active, bikes several miles a day without dyspnea or chest pain, no angina, no heart failure. Echo shows enteroapical dyskinesis with an EF of 25%, consistent with this EKG. Coronary angiography shows 100% proximal LED, total occlusion with bridging collateral and no other disease. So single vessel proximal LED CTO. His LVDP is 10, further attesting to the fact he has no heart failure. What is the next step? PCI of the proximal LED, viability testing, followed by PCI of the LED if the anterior wall is viable or standalone medical therapy. The correct answer here is C. Contrast this case with the previous question. This patient has no heart failure. He's not a stitch trial patient because again, no heart failure. 
and he has single vessel CAD, a CTO that is not easily amenable to PCI. Unlike the prior case where the patient had heart failure and she had single vessel CAD that was easily amenable to PCI, not a CTO, which is a complex form of PCI associated with up to three times higher complication rate depending on the specifics of that CTO. This particular patient uh, with no heart failure and with single vessel complex disease has a treatment indication that is similar to the, to the indication of treating stable CAD. This indication being severe angina. This is not the case here. He does not have severe angina. Therefore, he does not have an indication to revascularize that CTO of the LAD. PCI of a CTO should not be performed for the purpose, for the sole purpose of EF improvement. PCI has not improved EF or wall motion in the CTO trials, explore and revask trials. So CTO PCI in this setting is only performed to improve angina, which he doesn't have, not to improve EF. Again, this is not a stitch trial, not a heart failure patient, not a multivessel disease patient. This is more a stable CAD patient and you treat it as such. Now I would make the plot thicken here. What if he had angina? In this case, I would revascularize the LAD with no viability testing. I would treat it as a stable CAD with CTO. If he has severe angina, I would perform a complex PCI. Now, what if he has significant heart failure? Would you revascularize that LAD for the purpose of heart failure improvement? This would be close to stitch trial, but it's not really a stitch trial patient because unlike stitch, this is a single vessel disease not a global LV dysfunction with a global multivessel disease. And unlike the prior case with a single vessel LAD disease and heart failure, this patient has a complex LAD disease with a difficult high risk PCI. So actually, if he has significant HF, I would perform a regional viability testing for regional LED assessment and a regional PCI of the LAD if viable. This is actually a case, an uncommon case, and the only case I've presented so far where viability testing remains useful. I hope this presentation uh, has been helpful to you, and thank you for listening.